Hello everyone and welcome to Database Security Office Hours for May 2021. This month's topic is Advanced Data Masking. But before we get into the topic, just a couple of quick announcements. The first is we have revised our Database Security Live Labs this month. We've published a complete new series of labs. If you haven't worked with Live Labs before, it's a platform that allows you to get hands-on experience with Oracle technologies like Advanced Security, Database Vault, Audit Vault, and Database Firewall. And this month what we've done is we have updated the underlying infrastructure for the Live Labs to the latest Database 19C RU. We have updated the Audit Vault and Database Firewall to the current version 20.3. And we've updated Key Vault to 21.1. We have a new lab for transparent sensitive data protection. And we've updated many of the other labs, including the Data Masking and Subsetting Lab, which now includes a new section on subsetting, and the Audit Vault and Database Firewall Lab, which includes a new section on the 20.3 capability to detect data exfiltration attempts. If you haven't worked with Live Labs before, I suggest you go to https colon slash slash bit.ly slash go live labs. You'll see the URL down here at the bottom of the screen and take a look at what we've built for you. There's two labs in particular I want to call to your attention. You'll see these if you filter on database security. One is the Database Security Basics Lab. The Database Security Basic Lab walks you through what we consider to be the baseline security requirements for an Oracle database. This three-hour lab combines multiple of the individual labs you see on your screen now, like privilege analysis and unified auditing and native network encryption into one lab that walks you through everything. If you do no other database security lab, this is the one you should look at. The next lab is Database Security Fundamentals. This one's a little bit longer, six hours, but it includes all of the other labs that would work up to the maximum security architecture. Things like Database Vault, Audit Vault and Database Firewall, Key Vault. Uh, just a really good chance to get hands-on with the latest and greatest for database security. So bit.ly slash go live labs. Our final announcements for the month is kind of a long one, but you'll, you'll see why. And it doesn't even come from the database security team. Uh, our identity and access management group has released a new product called the Oracle Radius Agent. And this is important from a database security standpoint because the Oracle Radius Agent allows you to connect your Oracle databases to different authentication sources like the Identity Cloud Services or Oracle Access Manager for uh, improved and enhanced multi-factor authentication to the database. Now, when you think about database authentication, what you're usually looking at is local authentication, uh, in other words, password or operating system or certificate, where the database consults its own internal stores or its own, um, its own resources to determine if the person who's trying to log in is who they say they are and what privileges that person should have. As you scale up to multiple databases, local authentication authorization may no longer make sense, and so many people will go for centralized authentication. These are things like Kerberos and certificate-based can be centralized, as can password and radius, which is the topic of this particular announcement. As you scale up even more and you sometimes have lots of users in the database or a whole lot of databases to use, you may integrate your database with authentication services like an LDAP server or Microsoft Active Directory. And this is kind of the landscape of authentication and authorization for the Oracle database. And if you take centralized or centrally managed users out of there, this is what it's been for a very, very long time, all the way back to Oracle 8i. We added centrally managed users in 18C. Well, what's new this month is we have in, invested in Radius and we have created the Oracle Radius agent. In other words, you now have an Oracle provided Radius server rather than having to use some third party server. And the Radius server is pretty simple. It runs as a Docker image. You can install it, uh, it you, wherever, you, wherever you pretty much want, as long as it has access to the database. And this Radius agent acts as an intermediary between the database and whatever authentication service you want to use. And it handles that authentication um, intermediation using the Radius protocol. Now, 
I tend to talk about the RADIUS agent in terms of the database because that's my focus. I'm the database security product manager. But RADIUS is a really common protocol. It's used for operating system authentication. Uh, most switches and routers will use RADIUS for authentication. There's a lot of things that can use radi RADIUS uh, to authenticate with. From a use case standpoint, we really think there's two use cases that are going to be interesting with this new RADIUS agent. One of them is connecting the Oracle database to Microsoft Active Directory. Now I can hear what you're thinking. You're saying, well, wait a minute. We introduced a new way to do that in Oracle 18C, Centrally Managed Users, and that's all built into the database. I don't need anything else. Well, that's true, but here's why we think the RADIUS agent might be interesting, even in, in place of Centrally Managed Users. With centrally managed users, you are using the client, the database client is unaware that CMU is being used. And so when it comes time to authenticate, it handles either password or certificate or Kerberos authentication the way it normally would. Well, a client, a database client, does not actually send passwords to the database in, in most cases. Instead, what it does is the client will send a hashed representation of the password to the database. That way if someone were able to intercept it in communications, maybe you're not using network encryption, they can't read the password because it's not, you know, it's not even encrypted, it's hashed, it's one way, a one-way thing, can't be reversed. Uh, well what that means is in order to authenticate the database has to compare the hash that the client sent with a stored hash either in its own data store, the user table, or in whatever directory it's consulting. If that directory is Active Directory, that would mean that the directory would have to present to the database a hash in a format the database can understand. To do that, you would install the Oracle password filter for Microsoft Active Directory on the domain controller, and you would extend the Active Directory schema to create a place to hold that password hash. Domain ad admins are generally not in favor of doing this. They don't like installing third-party software on their domain controllers, and they certainly don't like extending their schema. And so almost everyone who implements centrally managed users goes with Kerberos for their authentication token. Well, with the RADIUS adapter, you get to, or the RADIUS agent, excuse me, you get to overcome that limitation because when the client is configured for RADIUS authentication, it can send the password to the database using the secure RADIUS protocol. And so the database actually gets the password, passes that off to the RADIUS agent, and then the RADIUS agent does a simple LDAP bind, over LDAPS of course, to the Active Directory domain controller. Uh, and what this means is you get all of the advantages of not having to go out and configure Kerberos and make sure all of your clients work with Kerberos and you still get the integration with Active Directory without having to extend the schema. Uh, so we think this is going to be a very popular use case. We look forward to seeing more from it. The next use case for the RADIUS agent is probably a little bit more obvious. We usually think of RADIUS in terms of multi-factor authentication, and that's exactly what the RADIUS agent gives us. In addition to connecting to an LDAP server, the RADIUS agent connects to the Oracle Advanced Authentication Service, and that Oracle Advanced Authentication allows you to bring in things like the Oracle Mobile Authenticator or Google Authenticator or one-time passwords sent over email or SMS or something like a YubiKey token, but it allows you to have multiple factors of authentication for your Oracle database. But we think both of these are going to be really popular. This was just released about 10 days ago, so I don't have a demo to show you yet, but I hope to do that in the near future. Expect to hear more to come on the Oracle Radius agent in future database security office hours. But now let's go ahead and turn to this month's technical topic, Data Safe Advanced Data Masking. Now let's start our discussion of data masking with the definition of data masking. And you know, it's interesting, I kind of looked around to see if there was a, a, someone I could quote for a good definition of data masking, and I actually didn't find anyone that I thought had given a good definition of it. So this is my definition of data masking. Data masking is a way to present usable data to a user, but the usable data is false. It's not the actual data that was there originally. Uh, now, to present that false data to the user, we have two different techniques. 
One of them is dynamic data masking. That's the industry term, not the Oracle term. Uh, in Oracle, we call this data redaction, just to make it easier to differentiate from static data masking, which is the next thing we're going to talk about. And what data redaction does is, as you select data out of the database, data redaction applies a policy to the data you've selected to remove certain parts, parts of the data, or remove all of the data, and replace it with fake data, or replace parts of the data with fake data. The classic use case for data redaction is something like a credit card number. Most of the time, you don't want people who select a credit card number to see the whole credit card number. Uh, under the PCI standards, everyone should just display the last four digits of the credit card number. Well, that's where data redaction does really well. Another place where data redaction does well is it allows you to prevent someone from coming in and maybe selecting the entire table that you have data and dumping that into a spreadsheet. Uh, because you can redact the sensitive columns to where they don't go out that direction. With dynamic data masking, with data redaction, policy controls who sees the unredacted data and who sees the redacted data. You can display it both ways. With static data masking, which I'm just going to call data masking from now on, you actually change the stored data. So what was a credit card number may still look like a credit card number, but it's not what was stored in there before. And you generally do this, the classic use case is development and test environments. Now in the Oracle world, we provide two different ways to do static data masking. One is Oracle Data Safe, one is data masking and subsetting. Okay. You usually mask data for one of two reasons. You may want to remove security risk from a, test, uh, a development or test instance. This is a pretty common thing. Every time you clone a database, that copy of the database is just another place where hackers could get into and steal your data. So removing the risk from it makes a lot of sense. The other reason why you might mass data is a regulatory compliance reason. Uh, you might mass data because PCI says you're not supposed to have sensitive uh, credit card numbers available for people to view, or healthcare information shouldn't be available to your test and development instances for developers to view, or it might be a personal data protection regulation like maybe the, the general data protection regulation out of the European Union that says you should minimize the amount of personal data that you store. But one of these two reasons is usually why you are masking. Okay? Now, in the Oracle technology stack, we give you two different ways to mask data. One of those is Oracle Data Safe. Among the many features of Oracle Data Safe is data masking. The other is an, is an enterprise manager pack called the Data Masking and Subsetting Pack. And among the features of the Data Masking and Subsetting Pack are data masking. In general, they have equivalent capabilities. You can use both of them to do data masking. Data safe, because it's a cloud service, tends to advance more rapidly. We do two week development sprints for data safe, and so you're, all, you're seeing something new in data safe every couple of weeks. Enterprise manager tends to release a new version every couple of years ago. So, uh, you know, with both of them, you can accomplish your goals. With data safe, you get kind of the latest stuff. We're going to use data safe today as we talk about advanced data masking, but do keep in mind that the things that we're doing are possible in Enterprise Manager's data masking and subsetting pack as well. Right? Now, we're going to look at three different scenarios today. And these are beyond just simple masking. If you've, if you've been attending office hours for a while, uh, you've probably seen me at some point demonstrate data masking when I was talking about data safe. And what I would have done was gone through and created a sensitive data uh, discovery job that would go out and find all of the sensitive data. And after finding all of that sensitive data, we would go ahead and uh, run a masking job. And I would click mask the data, and I would just accept the defaults. And what you would see at the end is that the data was masked and the security risk in the data had been removed because email addresses no longer were the real email addresses, credit cards were no longer the real credit cards, healthcare data was no longer the real healthcare data, things like that. What we're going to do today, though, is instead of going click, click, click and accepting the defaults, we're going to change some of the defaults. And I'll explain why, why we're doing this as we go through each of these three different use cases. The first use case that we're going to look at is deterministic masking. 
Now, determinism, deterministic and deterministic masking, simply means that given the same input, I produce the same output. It differs from random. With a random masking algorithm, giving an input, given the same input, I will produce potentially a different output every time I mask. So if I'm masking rust.lowenthalatoracle.com randomly, one time it may come out to Mary Sue, the next time it may come out to George uh, Stefan, or you know, it, it, it'll come out differently potentially each time. With deterministic masking, if I mask rust.lowenthalatoracle.com, it's going to come out to the same masked value even across multiple masking sessions, regardless of what database I'm masking it on, it always comes out to the same value. There are a couple of reasons why you might want to use deterministic masking. One of them that we frequently see is I have my production database, I have my development database, and on that development database, whenever I do something, I have a certain series of tests that I want to run. I want those tests to be logically consistent across multiple iterations. And to do that, I want to make sure that I'm testing on the same types of records each time. Well, I might use deterministic masking so that when I mask the first time and run my test, and then I clone the database back again so that I've got a new and an updated copy of the production database. I mask it again. Determinism means that the records will still be identifiable the same way. It won't be the actual data, but it'll be the same record. So you'll use deterministic masking to get repeatable test runs across different environment refreshes. Many times what you see is not all of the data is in one database. You'll have an application ecosystem. This is really common with microservices architectures where each microservice may have its own data store. And in those cases where you have data that is federated across multiple different databases, there is no referential integrity between those databases. Obviously, you can't have a, a foreign key pointing to a different database. So instead, what you do is you have different data stores and you depend upon the values being the same in each data store for the key values. Well, here you would use deterministic masking so that when I mask database A and database B and database C, those key values always have the same information in them and therefore I can join my records just like it was a production data store. Another reason why you might use data masking is that sometimes you'll get applications that don't use referential integrity even within a single database and yet they may depend upon key values being the same in different tables. With no referential integrity data masking doesn't know that the first name in this table should match the first name in that table, and so it can't mask those together unless you use deterministic masking. Now, DataSafe, which is what we're going to use for our example today, offers two different formats for deterministic masking. And I can kind of hear what you're saying. Russ just said two different formats, but if I look at the screen, I see four. Well, here's why. The first two you see on the screen, deterministic encryption and deterministic substitution, are the ones you are going to use the majority of the time. I'll explain the difference between those two in just a second. The third one you see, SQL expression, this is a way that you can take the output of a masking format, which could be deterministic encryption or deterministic substitution, and generate a another masked value. Uh, the classic example here would be email address, I mask first name, I mask last name, and then I use a SQL expression to create a masked email va uh, value that was first name dot last name for the masked values. And a user defined function is exactly what it sounds like. You're going to create the function if you want to that can be deterministic. But most of the time when you're talking determinism, you're going to be talking either encryption or substitution. Here's the difference between the two. With deterministic encryption, what happens is I take the original value and I feed that through a format-preserving cryptographic algorithm. And what spits out at the other end is a value that will always be the same if the input value is the same. With substitution, what I do is I take the incoming value, the original value, and I go to a table a lookup table and I look up a replacement value for that. So if the incoming value was product name, I might have a table that said database and exadata and ebusiness suite and enterprise manager and I might substitute for database 
exadata or something like that. It gives you the ability to better control what the format of the data is in the mass representation because you have a table of values you're going to look at. With substitution, your lookup table should always have at least twice as many rows as the table you're masking, by the way. Now, with deterministic encryption, same input, always the same output, and that is output is guaranteed to be unique. No two inputs should produce the same output. So rust.lowenthal and lowenthal.rust would never produce the same encrypted output. With substitution, you are guaranteed that the incoming value will always produce the same output, but two different input values might collide and produce the same output. So you use deterministic encryption when you need both determinism and guaranteed uniqueness of the value. You use deterministic substitution when you need determinism, but you don't care if there might be duplicate values in that column. Make sense? All right, we move on. Let's take a look at an example for deterministic encryption. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to select a database. I'm going to create a sensitive data model for my database. And I'm going to select which compartment I want to run my masking. I, I want to run this uh, sensitive data discovery in. I'll pick a schema and I'm just going to pick my development schema. And I will select what type of information I want to scan for. Because I want this to run quickly, I'm just going to use public identifiers. And I'll go ahead and I'll run my sensitive data discovery job. This takes a couple of seconds. And here we are. We've finished our sensitive data discovery. Let's look at the results. And what we see is we have, it will switch it to schema view to be, make it a little easier to view. We have two different tables. We're just going to look at the employees table. So we're going to say that first name, last name, and email address are sensitive in this particular database. We look at our report and we'll go ahead and click let's do masking. So now we're going to say, select the same database. We'll go ahead and name our masking policy so we can find it again later. I'll explain why here in a little bit. If I can spell deterministic, there we go. And we'll take a look at the defaults. Now, by default, we put in random names and random email addresses, but we don't want to do that. We're going to choose deterministic encryption. And that's all we have to do. We don't have to give it a regular expression. We're just going to choose deterministic encryption. Format preserving is automatic, so we're, we're good with just doing that. We'll confirm our policy. And we'll go ahead and execute this. We give it a seed for our deterministic encryption because we need a seed value, basically the encryption key. Now we're running our masking. It'll again take just a few minutes. It's one table, just around a thousand values or so, so it's fairly quick. And let's take a look at what we produced. And now let's look at the data. So before, Jonathan matched Jonathan, but now we see that our incoming value, our production Jonathan in development has become MMICYPZY and Carter has become RVXBSZ and Jonathan.Carter at OracleDemo.com has become, well you can see what it is here on the screen for you. The only difference between what we've done now and accepting those default values of random name and a random email address is that every time we mask, we're going to get the same output value, so we get repeatability. All right? This is determinism. Let's take a look at another advanced masking concept, and that is reversible masking. Now, you're probably saying to yourself, well, wait a minute, you don't want to be able to reverse masking. The whole idea of masking is that it permanently destroys the data so that you remove the security risk from it. You can't unmask it. Well, there are edge use cases where you might want to be able to mask data now and then go back and reverse that masking later. 
Uh, a couple examples of this. Suppose you're going to send data out for third-party processing. Maybe it's financial data, financial transactions, and you want to send it to someone to do fraud analytics on it. Or perhaps it is clinical trial data, and you want to send it to someone to do statistical analysis on it. When you send your data out, you don't want whoever is doing the enrichment of the data to be able to identify who the subject of that data is. They don't need to know who made the transactions. They're just looking for fraud patterns. They don't need to know who participated in the clinical trial. They're just looking for outcome type information. So you would send it out, masked, have whoever was doing your third-party processing do their data enrichment and get it back, and then you could reverse the masking so that you're able to see you know, who the actual person was. Another place where you often see reversible masking used is in joint ventures between different organizations or companies that are normally competing but sometimes cooperate. When they cooperate, they don't want to give away all of their customer base or all of their product information or something like that. So they might mask key information, share the data between the joint venture partners, get all of the data enrichment that comes from that joint venture, and then bring that data set back and reverse the masking on the identifying attributes so that they can get the full value for their joint venture. Now, reversible masking is really easy. It builds on our last use case. Deterministic encryption is the for masking format that can be reverse, uh, reverse masked. And all we do to do this reverse masking is when we run our masking, out, our masking job, we check that little box you see here in the, on the screen that says use this option to decrypt already masked values by a deterministic encryption format. That's it. Let's go ahead and look at an example of this. All right, so remember where we left off. Our data is masked. It's been masked deterministically, and we're going to go back in. We're going to do the same database. We're going to pick the same masking policy. That's why we named it last time. And we're going to go through. We're going to accept all of our defaults up until the very end. We're going to not, don't need to validate it. We know this is right. We just did it. We're going to go ahead and do this now. And we're going to use the same seed value. That's important. It has to be the same seed value and check that box. We submit the masking job. Masking is going to run. Again, it's one table, 1,000 values or so. Should take just a few seconds. And it's complete. We get a report at the end, just like every masking job. But when we go back and we look at our data, what we see is Jonathan has become Jonathan again, Carter has become Carter again, and Jonathan.Carter at OracleDemo.com has become Jonathan.Carter at OracleDemo.com. This is reversible masking. It's an edge use case, but it is one that pops up with surprising regularity. Let's look at our third and final use case, or advanced use case, and this one is not an edge use case. This one is very, very common. And here what we're going to talk about is producing more realistic looking test data. Now, DataSafe, as you're going through doing your masking, assigns a default masking format to every sensitive data type. And you see we've been changing that as we went along with deterministic masking. Simple masking just accepts the default, and the resulting data is secure. You've removed the risk from it, but it's not always pretty. You know, names look a little odd with just a bunch of different characters in there. They don't look like something a human wants to see. If you are masking a database because it's going to be used for something like user acceptance testing or training scenarios, you might want to have data that looks a little bit more realistic because that's more comfortable for your test and developers or your trainees to use. Now, to produce more realistic looking test data, we're going to use a couple of different formats. One of them, which you'll find out is my favorite, is random list. Random list is just exactly what it sounds like. We give the masking format a list of values, an array if you will, and the masking job will replace whatever is in the column it wants to mask with some value from that array. 
random substitution or deterministic substitution, as we said earlier. We're going to look up a value from a table and we're going to replace whatever the original value is with a value from that table. The only difference is random is truly random. You don't get repeatable results. Determinism, same thing each time. SQL expression says I'm going to create a masked value based on other masked values. You'll see why in just a second as we go through and do this. Group masking says I have multiple columns in this table and I want to mask them consistently. I want them all to be masked so that they are logically consistent. Uh, the classic example here and the one we're going to use in our demo in a minute is an address. I don't want to put Boise in Florida. I don't want to put New York City in California. I don't want to put Chicago in Texas. And so we mask things like city, state, and postal code as a group. That way they stay consistent. There's other masking formats you'll use to produce realistic looking text, uh, test data. Uh, things like fixed strings or numbers. Random numbers can be used that way where you adjust the randomness uh, and, the, and the scope of the random number to something that makes sense. Random dates, we're going to look at that and we'll talk about adjusting those. But these are all ways that you produce more realistic looking test data. Okay, let's look at an example here. We're going to go to data masking. I've already done sensitive data discovery for you. We'll mask that same database. And we're going to pick our sensitive data model. It's in my compartment, which is dbsec Russ. And we'll go ahead and name our masking policy, although unlike with deterministic masking, we're not going to reuse it. This is just you know, to find it again for iterative test runs if I want to. And we'll go ahead and click Continue. We'll choose our sensitive data model. I don't need to validate it because I know, I know it's right. I haven't made any changes to the schema. And so what's in this sensitive data model is employment information like salary and bonus, healthcare information, public identifiers, national identifiers, just a good data set to work with. Let's go ahead and continue. And now we're going to go ahead and set up our masking. As always, DataSafe has filled in default masking formats, but we don't want to use those. So for social security number, we like to see it with hyphens in there. For social insurance number, again, we like to see it hyphenated. We don't want just random characters for our first name. Instead, what we're going to do is we're going to use my favorite masking format, the random list. And when I choose random list, we'll see a box pop up for list of values. We'll go ahead and enter some first names. So we've got Manish, we've got Jose, we've got uh, Serafina. Let's go ahead and put Sasha in there. We also, uh, we'll let Bets be in there. Let's have a Manny, maybe a Mo. We'll skip Jack. We'll have a Mary and a Susan. And of course, you have to have a Karen in there. It's just, you, got, you must have a Karen. Okay, so we've just got names that we'll substitute in. For last name, we don't want to use a random list because we have lots of rows and we don't want to type an array that big. We want some kind of uniqueness in there. So I have a lookup table already created in the lookup schema. The lookup table is called lookup names. and I've got a couple of million rows in there of just first names and last name. I'm going to go ahead and do random substitution this time. So we'll delete the original format. We'll add in random substitution. And now we get to choose what schema, what table, what column are we going to use to do our masking with. I'll use the lookup schema, lookup underscore names table, and I'll use the last underscore name column. All right? We'll save this. Uh, let's see, for email address, our standard for email address is firstname.lastname at oracle.com. For my mass data, I don't want to generate a random email address. I'm masking first name and last name, and I want the email address to look consistent with that. So I'll use a SQL expression that's going to use mass first name dot mass last name at mass.com. I'll choose SQL expression. I'll paste this value in. I didn't want to have to type it out because I make typos. And this is what we'll produce, masked first name, masked last name. So the email address will be logically consistent with the masked first name and last name. Just looks better this way. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's go ahead and mask the address now. And what, as I mentioned earlier, what we're going to use is a group masking. So we'll select group masking. We'll give the group a name. I'll just call it my address group and we choose a format for that mask, and I'm going to use random substitution. 
Because I'm using substitution, I have to tell it which schema and table I'm using. So in my lookup schema, I have a table of addresses called lookup underscore addresses. Uh, if we take a look at what's in that table, what I've really done is just taken the postal code database and I've taken city, county, state, and postal code. Those are all logically consistent. And then I created street names and street numbers so that I'd have a nice big table to work with there. So we'll have address, we'll have, um, we'll mask city, we'll mask state, and we'll go ahead and mask postal code all as one group. And so we're going to take these four columns and we'll map them to their corresponding column in the lookup addresses table. So address underscore one becomes address one, city and state stay the same because that's how I name my columns, and postal co underscore code becomes postal code because that's what my lookup table has. All right. For address two, this is usually where like apartment number 16 or suite 575 comes in. Instead of using a lookup table, what we're going to do is we're going to create a complex masking format where we stack multiple different formats together. We'll use my favorite random list and we'll say things like uh, this could be an apartment or this could be a suite or this could be an office or it could be unit number or maybe um, maybe a post office box number okay we'll add in a fixed string so that we put a space in between the list of values and whatever's coming next and whatever's coming next we'll make it be a random name I've got to remember to put my space in here though okay and so we'll choose a random number number and we'll give it some number in between oh I don't know a hundred and nine 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 so I might get apartment 105 and suite 273 and PO box 953 all right for uh, let's see what do we have left for country let's go ahead and move everyone to the United States I don't care where they're coming from we're just going to use a fixed string and we'll say everyone moves to the USA just easy to work with uh, for date of birth, uh, we've already selected some date in the past for date of birth, but that's between 1950 and now. I don't have any one-year-old employees, so what we're going to do is we're going to choose a random date, and we'll say that my oldest person working here is born in, oh, I don't know, 1970, and they could be 30-odd years old, so we'll say that they're... Uh, they're born no later than maybe 2003. Okay, so everyone working here is, is born sometime between 70 and 2003. Just so we get something that makes more sense for the data we're working with. For last insurance claim, um, let's go back and just we'll use a random list again and we're just going to put in some things that might be used for an insurance claim. So a random list comes in and we'll have um, Let's do a sprained ankle and maybe uh, a headache. You could have an insurance claim for a headache or a sore toe. Um, perhaps a bruised ego is why you've gone to see the doctor. Uh, let's see, what else could there be? Hair loss. You know, we got to worry about hair loss. That's always worth going to see the doctor for. And, uh, oh, I don't know, maybe, uh, maybe an aching tooth or something like that. All right, so these are just some things we might put in for the reason we went to file an insurance claim. For income, we're going to put a salary range that's more normal for our company. So again, we'll use, uh, well, we'll put a number in, but let's just do a fixed number. So we'll make everyone make the exact same salary, uh, 2000, $2,134. That's a, that's a good number to make. And let's see, for bonus, let's give let's have some variation in our bonuses. So we'll say again a random number, but we're gonna go somewhere between some people make a ten dollar bonus at the end of the month, and some people make uh, I don't know a five hundred dollar bonus at the end of the month. All right, we have now changed the masking format for every single column that we're going to mask. Let's go ahead and do this and take a look at what the output data looks like. Right, so we'll go ahead and create our masking policy. We'll tell it to run now. 
We don't have to give it a seed because we're not doing any encryption in this. Let's real quick just take a look and make sure our data is where it should be. So our data, remember we we unmasked before, we reversed the masking. So all the data is back where it belongs. Okay. And we're going to go ahead and execute our masking. This will take a little bit longer because more advanced masking techniques. But not a crazy amount of time. It's just one cut, one table. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is two tables. Uh, so this is two tables. All right. Our masking job is just about done. We take a look at our report. We can see that, sure enough, we did 15 columns across two tables. We can see what we masked, how many rows we masked, but here's where the proof comes in. Look at our mass data. You're comparing the development column with the production column. So Jonathan Carter became Mary Sweeney. Social security numbers look like social security numbers. Email addresses look logically consistent. I have moved everyone to California in the USA because that was what I put in my lookup database, but the city, state, and postal code all match. We've created apartment, oh, I need to get rid of the double quotes, but we've created apartment numbers and unit numbers and office numbers that look realistic. Uh, we've made our development insurance claim something that, you know, there's no security risk in, but you can see that there is at least some variation there. And this, this is how you make your test data look more realistic. You go beyond the defaults. See, I told you I'd talk about beyond the defaults. You go beyond the defaults and you make your masking formats something that will be prettier. No difference from a security standpoint, but it can be a big difference if your mass data is being used for acceptance testing or training. All right, that's it for our advanced masking scenarios. What I want to leave you with is masking is very customizable. You don't have to accept the defaults. There is a lot of capability in there, and we didn't even go into you can create your own custom masking formats. There are techniques like deterministic and reverse, reversible masking. You won't use these every day, or most of you won't use these every day, but you are almost certainly come across cases where you need deterministic masking and reversible masking. You'd be surprised how often it pops up as a, as a, a good solution to a problem. And finally, with just a little bit of additional work on your masking policy, you can really make your test data look good and, and realistic. So keep all of that in mind as you're doing your masking. That's it for this month's office hours. I hope to see you next month. If uh, things go as planned, we'll be talking about Audit Vault and Database Firewall 20.4. There are some exciting new things coming in this new version of Audit Vault and Database Firewall, and that will be on Wednesday, the 9th of June. Thanks. Mm -hmm.